The Ross Owen Show is sponsored by Hullmasters, Edry Trust, World War II TV and Indigo Unified Communications. The feedback from the fans is absolutely fantastic. How does that make you guys feel? We're very pleased about it, aren't we? We're just, uh, we, we knew it was a big responsibility and we knew there was a risk involved in making this and, and that uh, it, we, we, you, you, with the best will in the world, you never know quite how something's going to work out when you set about it. You just try and go, go at a job with the best tools possible and, um, and, and uh, take it seriously and know that, uh, try not to disappoint people and uh, all that. And so, so it feels very good. It feels like, uh, whatever happens now, uh, it feels like we can wipe our brow and say we, we did a good job. Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, we could have recreated Laurel and Hardy, you know, try to do exactly what they did. And we could have tried to been, be as funny or funnier than Laurel and Hardy. But I doubt that would be as satisfying as what we've actually done, which is provided a human glimpse at these two performers and I think that's why fans of Laurel and Hardy are responding so well to the movies that yeah. they already have the films we already have like their work so yeah. that's not taken away yeah. and we're not even trying to compete no, with that no, work no. what what I think people are really finding gratifying about watching the film is like seeing the beating hearts of these two men and what were those intimate conversations like between just the two of them that, that nobody can know so uh, that's very gratifying, you know, that emotional response that people are having. Steve, you've been known to do Stan Laurel impressions over the years. How did this one differ? Because it wasn't exactly an impression of it. No. Well, I mean, I've, I mean I've, I've done, I think, I even think I may have done, I think, I did Spitting Image years ago, which was puppets of famous people. And I think I may have done Stan Laurel. It was like 20, I mean, Christ, some of this stuff was like nearly 30 years ago. Yeah. Anyway, it was that was clearly just an impersonation. Um, so, uh, well, of course, this was very different because although I had some idea of how he spoke, the rhythm of how he spoke, I think I'd tried to do it a few times. And, but, um, of course, this was trying to get under the skin of the man. And uh, the, 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 the being doing a voice uh, or doing gestures is just the, the sort of... Uh, it's just surface stuff, you know. It really is superficial stuff. Um, important though it is on a technical level, it really is is uh, just scratching at the surface. There really, um, really are two characters that each of us were playing. There's Laurel and Hardy, which is their stage personas sure. and all this mm -hmm. physical mm -hmm. tics and gestures that they did mm -hmm. to make people laugh. Mm -hmm. And then there's Stan and Ollie, the real men. Mm -hmm. uh, when we have some glimpses of them in uh, documentary interviews and some, te you know, audio interviews, that kind of thing. But for the most part, they're somewhat mysterious. You know, they were very, uh, especially Ollie, because uh, most interviews you see it was always Stan. That's right. Yeah, That's yeah, right. yeah. There's more there's a couple good yeah. interviews with Oliver, but um, yeah. So so. In a way, like that, we were more concerned with showing Stan and Ollie more than showing Laurel and Hardy, because again, Laurel and Hardy are beautifully still well, available. That, I mean, that was, I think, what was smart about it. That what we're saying about who they were is, if you like, um, it's ed very well educated guesswork, mm -hmm. uh, because we take what we know and we make assumptions about that, and it's conjecture, but it's conjecture that's informed by research and diligent uh, application uh, and, um, and 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 the knowledge that there's a little bit of them in their work and so um, when we see them in their, their private lives we see glim uh, when we see Stan and Ollie we also see glimpses of Laurel and Hardy yeah. um, because that was always there in them mm -hmm. um, but, but um, and, and then beyond that we see we, we know things about them and we we, uh, we can and we know about the politics between them uh, to some extent, so we can we can hazard a guess about those things and how that might have manifested itself. And uh, um, and th so th that's something I think which is smart because it's not uh, uh, taking away from what is already there; it's just adding to it. So we're adding to the Laurel and Hardy conversation. We're not trying to divert it or replace it. Yeah, we're also trying to carry on the mission of their films, their overall kind of message. Yes, they wanted to make you laugh. And of course, they consistently do, did that through their entire careers. 
but they always had a humanist message to their films, or at least an embrace, an embrace of the foolishness of humanity. Uh, and there was a gentle and a kindness and a sympathy towards human beings that their films always had, even when they were being mean to each other or getting into terrible you know, messes. Uh, there was this larger kind of embrace of, of, of the human, uh, of the human it, it, story, you know? And our film has tried to do that in our own way. We didn't try to do it in their way. Uh, we tried to do it yeah. in our own way, but in some ways the mission is the same, you know? Mm -hmm. Touch yeah. people, make That's them know right. you're not alone, you know? Yeah. We are living in, I, I try to draw power with their work, the, the, when they were doing their shows, they were in tough times in, in America during the Depression, and Europe was in a very dangerous place, the rise of fascism, and yet they were doing these funny little comedies. And, they, um, and they're, they're a little sanctuary from the hardships of life, was to enter into the world of their movies. And what I think we're trying to replicate in the film is a place to go and, and see uh, an authentic, genuine, uh, gentle relationship between two men and uh, and in, in, in this this cold unstable sort of troubling world it it should be like taking a warm bath um, and and and, and uh, enjoying the humanity uh, that's that's uh, that, that's displayed by them sure. John you uh, had probably the most challenging prosthetics Mm -hmm. uh, you did the prosthetics, Steve, that, yeah. But, um, <coughs> I saw something online, an actor you had, had spoken to you and you'd given him advice about the, the fat suit. Do you want to share that with us? Do you know what I'm, do you know what I'm referring to here? About how you oh, kept no. cool? Oh, oh, I thought you meant making sure you have a hole in the costume to take a pee. That was, <laughs> but, that was very <laughs> important. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the prosthetics were challenging, but not for me. I just sat there while they put glue on my face, you know. Um, no, Mark Coulier and his team are, you know, some of the best in the world at, at doing this kind of transformational makeup. We, I think we were both a little skeptical about uh, prosthetics and thinking it would look kind of cartoonish or... Mm. or or, or trivialize things and make it look um, unsophisticated. I just thought, oh, it's better not to try and look like them, but just to try and capture their, their essence. Mm. But I think we ended up looking pretty, pretty you know, good. You know what the truth is about prosthetics? Everyone makes such a big deal about the rubber, you know? This thing, oh, how did they build it and they sculpted it and how is it on you? But when, when you actually get into the makeup and you watch these guys working, the rubber is the least impressive part of it. That's one sculpture that they then take molds off of. But are, the impressive thing every day is the custom work they're doing every day to paint that. Mm. So they're painting, they have, the, they have the sophistication of like a great oil painter in mm. terms of like what is the balance of color and they do this Reckling thing where they they put a brush into color and then they flick it so mm. little droplets mm. are hitting you mm. for mm. an hour mm. you know this kind of painting mm. like yeah, that yeah. so yeah. the artistry involved was very impressive in that way mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. but uh, ultimately you know well you wanted to <laughs> know about the fat suit they had yeah, this it was thing like called a, a cooling yeah. suit it was invented for surgeons actually who have to do long operations oh, it's a t-shirt that has plastic tubing going all through it and around it and then they pump cool water through these tubes and it cools down your core and it allows you to keep going uh, so I had one of those on underneath the suit, and I'd go plug into this cooler whenever I had a chance. But yes, uh, that anyone who uh, has to be a mascot or wear one of those. I used to be settled the squirrel. I wish I had one of those oh, things. Exactly. Yeah, I yeah, know yeah, exactly. You know, but you know, it can get very uh, <laughs> can get very dangerous for your health very quickly if you're not yeah. careful about staying cool. Sure. Well, guys, I want to that say that in a pee hole. <laughs> the pee hole, very important. I want to wish you all the best with the film. On behalf of all the fans, uh, he's done a great job, and uh, congratulations and thanks for doing the movie. Yeah, well, thank you, Ross. Thanks, thank you. thanks, guys. Appreciate thanks, I appreciate it, Jim. I'm with Shirley Henderson and Nina Ariander, who play Laurel and Hardy's wives, Ida and Lucille. And uh, girls, I have to say, I watched the movie last night. And you guys almost stole the show. If there's any funny bits in that movie, it's down to you guys. How does that make you feel? I'll come, come to you first, Shirley. Uh, it feels fun. It was great. Um, I, that was the first I saw the film last night as well. And uh, yeah, it was it was it was good fun. And Nina's Nina steals it. She's got some fantastic lines, so she's brilliant. We spend a lot of time together. We hung about off and on set. It was just always the two of us, and uh, we just played around together and just got to know each other. And and we were not shy of 
practicing and uh, uh, improvising and playing around with these scenes together offset to try and find what is this we wanted to make it good and 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 i think it became more humorous than we could even have imagined um, and sharper and um, and then john he let us develop little bits add little bits and he encouraged that and just that combination um is what you finally saw on on the screen you know it, yeah. it became more than i think we had imagined Nina, what was your take on it? I mean, how, how, how did you enjoy making the movie and, and what kind of research did you have to put into the role? Uh, well, luckily, the research that I was given, um, I think from you guys, actually, it was uh, absolutely invaluable. It was it brought such depth to Ida and it kind of 100% validated her ferocity and her love for her husband. And I couldn't have done that without without the research, yeah. Now, you do you have Russian blood or so, you, you, because you come into this knowing she had a, a sort of Russian accent right no I'm a hundred percent Ukrainian um, oh. so the the accent is it's a little different yeah and I had to tweak it and and she spent so much time in California so it was that kind of blend of an immigrant who has lived in the States for so long so I was trying to make that as specific as I could yeah, when we asked different people who had spoken to her uh, what her accent was like she got a harsh accent or a soft accent some said harsh, some said soft, and this one guy said, listen, I've got a phone call recorded from the 60s, you can have that, and then you can... And so was that a, help, a big help for you? That phone call kind of it, it set up the entire tone of her for me, and it was just not only her softness, but also her humour in it and, and her the vulnerability in it as well. And it kind of... It, we were able to improv certain scenes just based on how she said hello, and so, and that was only from the recording that we heard that. That wasn't in the script. So, without that recording, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that opened up your world, didn't it? It for did. Her? Yeah. It absolutely did. Yeah. Shirley, there's people in America who knew Lucille right. very well, yeah. and they said the same thing that you mastered the accent. Um, so, what kind of research did you put into playing Lucille? Just looking for a little bit of footage. I finally found a couple of clips of her. Um, Many years later, she was an older lady at that point, um, talking about Oliver and her, her life with Oliver. So I could hear, I mean, obviously it wasn't a young voice she had at that point, but there was enough in there for me to, to get her, her sound. I thought she had quite a sweet sound. It wasn't a too strong an accent, um, in my what I could hear anyway. And just the, the things that she was saying about Oliver, um, such lovely things, um, that these were clues in for me to, to try and begin, you know, to, to create Lucille, so it, it, it was very, very important to find something, um, and so I was so grateful when I came across that. Nina, is it difficult going into a role playing a real person as opposed to a fictional character? It, it is it is a little more difficult. There's a little more kind of, there's fear in it because you, you there's a responsibility to honour that person. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, you take that fear, you, you get as much information as you can, and then you have to allow yourself a little bit of license because you'll never be able to obviously fully embody that person. Sure. But there is a, there is, it's, it's a little more difficult because there's this sense of responsibility right. mm -hmm. to her, to the family, to the fans, obviously, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, when did you guys first see John and Steve in costume, or in makeup, rather? It was one of the. It was the when they, they did. Um, what's the song? The Wasn't it way out? Trail of the Lonesome Pine. Lonesome Pine. Lonesome that's the song. Pine. Yeah, yeah. we we were in the auditorium. Um, I think they'd actually asked us to be there, and that was the first Nina and I. We sat down, and then they came on the stage and just took our breaths away. I found it very moving. It was like it was just for real, you know. And then when they did the routine, and it was just timed to perfection, um, just blew our minds really um, so that was the first we'd, we'd properly seen them fully kitted out and they didn't want us to see them no. in uh, in hair and makeup before no, that no so it really it was quite the experience yeah, yeah and just watching them you know the first couple of runs at it and then getting more and more confident as the characters watching them actually there they are morphing into these people right in front of us it was it was really amazing you met Cassidy uh, yeah, who's yeah. Stan Laurel's great granddaughter yeah. what was that like for you God, I mean, I didn't know she was coming, and I, no. I just, I don't know. I felt like seeing a, like a celebrity yesterday. Yeah. It was just such an honor that, and to have her say, "I really enjoyed it." I, I mean, oh, that just took my breath and away. And it's just there. I didn't even know yeah. anything about that. No, that the, it, the, it makes you think. Yes, these people really live. That this really did happen. Um, and there's, 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 there they are. You know, they're standing right in front of us. It was a lovely feeling. Made me a little nervous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we also had, I don't know if you know this, but last night, um, a last-minute guest uh, came. It was Stan Laurel's great-niece, right. 
was in, yeah, his, his nephew's daughter, so um, she, she loved it as well. She cried at the movie as well. And we had Bernard Delphone's nephew in as well last night, who... who uh, he's Rufus. Rufus is, is another one that was hilarious, and it, the facial expressions he was pulling. And, and his hair and everything, and yeah. it was, like, very, very funny, yeah. But he, oh. he was great. We spent a lot of time with Rufus as well. A lot of our scenes we improvised and created from... You know, it would just say they sit down together, or they just walk into the theatre, and we, we that he was great at playing around as well. I think they really summed it up in the trailer as well when they showed the scene where uh, you guys walk away and Rufus says, you know, yeah. two double acts for the price of one. Yeah. Um, he improvised that. Yeah, that oh, was, did he? Yeah, yeah that's that a, a great line, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Such yeah. a great line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so overall, um, a lot of great vibes from the Laurel and Hardy community which I think is important to you yeah. guys, isn't it? Very, very. very. That yeah. means the world to us. Yeah. yeah, yeah. because you want to do the best you can. You want to be honourable to the, the past and and bring something that will work today as well, that is, is accessible today. So hopefully, fingers crossed, that's worked. And to honour the relationship that the fans have with, yeah. with Stan and Ollie is also very important to us yeah. because there's such a love from yeah. the community Absolutely. that for us it's very important to honour them. Yeah. Just to finish off, uh, favourite scenes to shoot? Do you have a favourite scene from the movie? There's different ones. I mean, I actually loved the dinner scene in the end when you and I got that. We got that. I think that's where we found our the, the, what we were playing, what we were trying to do. It was very sharp and very. Um, I mean, it was, a, it was a difficult scene to film, but I think we found something. Nina and I found something between us. Um, what our rhythm was. Mm. So we had good fun doing that. Um, and individually, I think I liked the scene. Uh, with John when we were just lying on bed together and we were just like cuddling into each other and um, that was uh, that was to me that was like we the le the levels underneath all the the pub the, the showmanship deep down with the heart you know that was yeah. ten the tenderness that we we're looking for and what about you Nina? I I actually really had so much fun with us struggling in the theater yeah, to yeah, get yeah. to our seats and right. and the kind of the physicality of right. moving the seats and <laughs> Anything you guys threw at me, I was just, it was kind That's of right. actor candy That's for right. me. And the other one was the, the moment you mentioned at the end. That was a very special moment yeah, yeah. for me with you. Right. Um, and I'll never forget that day that we shot that. That's that was right. very, that That's was right. very special That's for me. Right, yeah. I don't want to give it away. There's two men. They've all got yeah. something in them, sure. really, you know. Well, the movie comes out in theatres January 11th. Right. Everybody's looking forward to it. We're all excited. Uh, thanks to you guys for giving us your time today. And best of luck with the movie. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you so lovely. much. Thanks Thank you. Very much. Thank you, guys. Okay. So I'm with director John S. Baird. How you doing, John? Very well, Ross. Very good to see you after uh, yesterday's uh, celebrations. Yeah. Are you pleased with the, the feedback you're getting so far? Even from the trailer alone, lots of people saying it's very emotional. Yeah, it's great. I mean, you know, you, you, you do these things because uh, you want people to see them or you want people to experience them. And, you know, when you get positive feedback, it's always great, you know. And, and the trailer has you know, has has gone down really well. And first of all, big thank you to yourself for the amount of promotion that you that you do and, the, you know, the, how you get behind this film. So thank you very much for doing that because if it wasn't for the likes of yourself, you know, it would be a lot harder. Um, so, but I am, I'm very, very, very pleased with the response so far. First of all, it's an absolute pleasure, you know, I mean, it's, it's just fantastic to be involved and uh, I appreciate you asking me as well. No problem. Uh, now, let's talk about how, how it first came out, uh, about, because you are a Laurel and Hardy fan. In fact, what, what's very appealing about this movie is basically most of the cast and crew are all Laurel and Hardy yeah. fans anyway. It's a big labour of love. Yeah. But, but how did you get brought into it and tell us how um, it all came about? Well, I, I had done a movie called Filth um, about four or five years ago and uh, Jeff Pope, who was a writer of Laurel, the Stan and Ollie film, He'd done a film called Philomena, and they came out around about the same time when we had been at different functions and, and gatherings at the same time. And he, we got talking, and he sent me this script, and I just fell in love with the idea of doing a film about Laurel and Hardy, and very much like yourself, had wondered why on earth people, you know, someone hadn't done it before. Um, but I have been, you know, I've been a fan of Laurel and Hardy since I was eight years old. Uh, there's, a, there's a very sort of... Uh, Embarrassing, but a slightly cute photograph of me dressed as Stan Laurel at the f the school fancy dress um, day, and a mate of mine is is, is Oliver Hardy. So, a true fan then. Yeah, love affair has gone gone back, f you know, for you know, almost forty years, you know. But but in, but with the actual film itself, Jeff sent me the script, and and originally it was a TV movie script, you know, so it had to be developed up into into a feature film. 
um, and we had to find the right cast and, and get the right financer and stuff. So it was a big it was a big uh, undertaking. But you know here we are four years later and, and we premiered last night. So it's been very enjoyable, you know. And you've been there from the beginning as well, you know. So you've seen how long it's it's taken. And you've been very patient as well, because you know like a lot of fans can get very impatient well, when's it happening is it going to happen is it really going to happen you know but are they going to do it right you know and i'm sure you've fielded a lot of concerns from from people out there who are worried that we haven't done them justice but hopefully we have i have to say i'll tell you now the general feedback uh, from the trailer alone has been absolutely incredible okay. so many people had that point of view where they don't like Biopics, and I know this isn't directly a yeah. biopic. It's only about this 1953 tour. There is a little bit of dramatic license, yeah. um, and, I, and I have to say there is a little bit of dramatic license. Yeah. What reservations did you have? Because uh, when I was talking to the girls, it's, there's that saying: if you're going to play an icon, you've got to get it right, or the fans yeah. will come down on you. You know, like a ton of bricks. Um, did you feel a lot of pressure in that sense? I, th I think we all felt a lot of pressure, you know. And on on the day one on set, we got all the actors and, and all the crew. Uh, on stage, we were actually in a theatre doing one of the theatre scenes. We got them all on stage, and I said, "Listen, guys, the big word here is responsibility, and we've all got a responsibility f to Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy to make sure that this does them justice." You know, and that's all I needed to say. And we had 39 days shooting, and every day they came with that responsibility and that and that ethic, work ethic. You know, whether it was Steve or John or the cinematographer or production designer, they came with that responsibility uh, and that love for these two guys. And we just wouldn't have had anybody involved if they didn't have that. If I thought people were getting involved just for a, you know, just 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 for the money or just for another job, they wouldn't have been on this show. Um, but you know, you the biggest the biggest judge for me uh, for the film is Cassidy Cook, Stan's great granddaughter. And my feeling is, if Cassidy likes it and she thinks it works, then it doesn't matter about it's anybody else. Matters. You know, it's the it's that's the living, breathing relative. And she's been very positive, and she loves the film, and, and you know we're very fortunate to have her here in London. So, but as you say, big responsibility, big responsibility. Now let's talk about the casting. Uh, who did you bring into this? Did, did you have any say in the casting, or was it written? These are the two guys we want to play Laurel and Hardy. Or how did that work? No, I think I think as a director, you uh, you have to have you know the, the 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 final say over the casting and and you you know or else it's not worth getting involved in the job you know. So uh, yeah, it's up to you. I mean, you're you're pulling all the departments together, whether it's cinematography or production design or costume or makeup. You have the final say on everything. They run everything past you, whether it's. Is he wearing blue socks or red socks today? You know, literally, you have you have to sign off on everything. So, um, so the casting, yeah, was it was our first choices. Steve and John. Um, I met Steve for dinner, and we had a very serious conversation. And halfway through it, he, without being prompted or without any warning, he dropped his napkin on the floor, and bent down to pick it up, and then bashed his head on the table on the way up and went into, you know, purposefully went into Stan Laurel and the shivers just went up my spine, you know, I thought, oh my God, this is incredible. And uh, and John said something very poignant to me when I spoke to him, first of all, he said, um, he said, it's a frightening prospect playing Oliver Hardy, but it's even more frightening the thought of someone else playing him. So, and I thought, oh my God, that is a incredible thing to say Very much. you know and uh, so I knew how I knew how responsible these two were they do have a lot of similar backgrounds as well with Steve being from up north and and, and, and John's history as well and, and, yeah. and you know entertainment as well yeah and I think that helps I mean um, and again both are big fans as well yeah both huge fans I mean I think you know it's been documented how how many comedians use Stan and Ollie as is their big reference, you know. Mm -hmm. You you know you ask most comedians who are up there in, in the in, you know in the top the top three in the top one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but I I read something really interesting yesterday in the Independent, and, and it was a uh, an article about Stan and Ollie, and um, it was really about Stan actually, and it said that at Stan's funeral, Buster Keaton stood up to to do a speech, and he said that 
you know, people thought that, that me and Chaplin were the geniuses, he said, but we weren't, it was, it was Stan Laurel that was right. a genius, you know. That, that's absolutely true, but Stan Laurel also said, um, isn't it, Stan said my name shouldn't be in the same sentence as Charlie Chaplin, so he equally yeah. paid tribute to Chaplin, and, and as you know, was Chaplin was, his, uh, it was Chaplin's understudy in the early days of our friends. Yeah, I had an incredible experience, Ross, I don't know if I've ever told you about this, uh, on a flight, I was flying to um, uh, LA, to do the music for this and sitting next to this young lady who uh, got chatting to and she was basically asking me what I was doing in, in LA and I said oh I'm going to be working on a film about Laurel and Hardy and I didn't think she knew who Laurel and Hardy was so I went in a big explanation about Laurel and Hardy and basically um, she was quite interested in, in who this was and I thought oh it's good so I asked her you know what she did and she said oh I'll do a little bit of acting and anyway it turned out she had done a, quite a lot of acting, and she'd been in Game of Thrones, and she'd been in uh, she'd she'd been in the new James Cameron film, and so we chatted and chatted, and at the end of the end of the uh, at the end of the flight, uh, when it had too much uh, red wine, we exchanged details, uh, but all the way through the flight, very interested in this Laurel and Hardy film, uh, and we exchanged details, and, and her name was Una, and she and I said Una, Thank can God. I have? I said Una, can I have your Surname, please, from a former thing. She said, "Oh, yeah, it's Chaplin," <laughs> and Una Chaplin. Yeah. And uh, and I just started laughing. I said, "Oh my God!" I said, "I've spent the whole flight explaining who Laurel and Hardy was, and, and, <laughs> and Stan Laurel was your grandfather's understudy." And she she laughed, and uh, and it was inc incredible. I told Cassidy this this story yesterday, and she's dying to meet Una, you know. But yes, yeah, Stan did love Charlie Chaplin. Yeah, he did. I think the difference between Chaplin and and Keaton and and, S and Laurel was the fact that you know you can see you can see the real technicality with with with, uh, with Chaplin and, and Keaton, yeah, but you can't see it with Stan because he was, it was a more human, mm -hmm. you know, it was a more human form of comedy, and it it, it it's and I think that's even more difficult to do, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think I think Laurel was the genius, you know. Everybody could relate to Laurel and Hardy, you know. We all know a Laurel and Hardy, and I think you know they did, they did stand out from other double acts of that era, yeah. and that's why they successfully, I think, made that transition from silence yeah. to comedy as well. They can you think of? Can you think? I mean, I've I've often thought about this. Has there been any other actor, regardless of its comedy or or serious drama, who made such a successful transition, and who was? as successful, if not more successful, when they transferred from silent to talkies. I can't think of no. I can't think of anybody who did it. No. You know, no, and no. I, I don't think I'd talked enough about I, I don't think I'd talked enough about the the, the, the way they did that, you know? Because that's a huge it's a huge it thing. It really is, yeah. You know? I mean when you think about um, Harold Lloyd and, and Buster Keaton yeah. yeah and Chaplin even they did do sound movie but they were never is successful. No, I mean, absolutely not. No, absolutely not. When you think about the the Laurel and Hardy movies, yeah, uh, and how big their their talkies were, um, bigger, right, than yeah. the silent stuff. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Right? And I think that, uh, yeah, I I I, don't, I just don't think anybody compares to them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So now, um, my my final question to you would be about still on the subject of casting, uh, the girls. Um, I don't want to give too much away. We sort of the, the, the film comes out in January, but the girls uh, as a drama. But the girls put a lot of humour into it. I thought they were brilliant. You worked with Shirley, obviously yeah. on Filth. Yeah. You obviously casted Nina as well, who mastered the accent. She's mm -hmm. got Ada's accent down to a T. Mm -hmm. How did you go about the casting process for so, the girls? So as, I, as you say, I've worked with Shirley before. Um, we weren't looking for. We were looking for an American actor to play Lucille, um, but. John actually, John Riley had said, look, I've worked with Shirley before. I think she's one of the best actors I've ever worked with. I want her to be Lucille. And I was like, well, I'm totally fine with it. And Shirley went, you know, God bless her, went on tape and, and you know, did the, did, the rehear did, did the sort of audition and convinced everybody. With Nina, I was dead set on getting someone of Slavic descent to play Ida. Yeah, it had to be someone. Good move. Yeah, it had to be someone who could understand the tough kind of love that these that these mm -hmm. people have, you know. Um, and Nina's parents are from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so she completely got it. Totally. And, uh, and to be honest, really added to that part. You know, she a lot of the humour that comes from their characters, they wrote themselves, you know. So... Um, 
yeah, they were they were just wonderful. They were absolutely wonderful. I'd work with them again in a heartbeat. And that great line from Rufus, um, two double acts for the price of one. Two double acts for the price of one. You know, and that's exactly what it is. That's yeah. exactly what it is. The film really comes to life when, when the wives arrive and and, and what they interject and in, 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 to it as well. And uh, and as I say, as I said yesterday at the beginning of the premiere speech, um, you know, I was very blessed with the cast. Very blessed. Well, John, I regard myself as being a, a die-hard fan and I just want to thank you for taking on the project and you should be very proud. Everybody should be very proud. You have done a great job and we are very grateful that you have put so much um, thought and, and detail and, and, and cared you know, about the fans and, and, and the family. Well, I, I have to thank you again. Thank you for all your support and uh, it's a pleasure getting to know you. Thanks again, John Beard. So my next guest is Cassidy Cook, great granddaughter of the one and only Stan Laurel. How does it feel to, to be uh, here in London? Is it your first time here? It's not my first time here. I came uh, originally when I was 12 years old with my grandmother and I've been a few years back and now this is probably the first time in five years that I've been back. Now you've come here for a very special reason. You've come to see Stan and Ollie, the movie. I think it's been very important to everybody that you got to see the film and, and they wanted to find out what you thought of the film. So now that you've seen it, what do you think? I think it's a beautiful love story about friendship. Um, you know, it's obviously a drama, but it's it's got every every little bit that we could have hoped for to really show how brilliant and witty my great-grandfather was, uh, the relationship that he had with Babe over the years. Um, you know, I I really think it's just a beautiful story. I think Lois would have loved the film. I think that she, it was always important to her that the boys be portrayed in a good light and that, you know, most importantly, it, this, this film brings a whole new generation of uh, potential fans and admirers to understand who they were and what they have done for, you know, comedy and, you know, just theater in, in general. And I think the message we're all trying to get across and with the film is to try and introduce the next generation to Laurel and Hardy. And I think that this movie will do that. The trailer uh, alone is, people are, the response has been great. People are saying they've been crying at the trailer. Uh, how did, did it affect you emotionally, this movie? Um, you know, I laughed. I did cry in a few bits. Um, but I overall, I'm just so grateful to see them up on screen. It's been a long time coming. And Jeff Pope did a beautiful job to really make sure that he portrayed, like I said, my grandfather in a light that um, the world really didn't know about. They didn't know that he was a writer. They didn't know he was a director, um, in addition to being an actor. And he always wrote content that made Babe the star, and he kind of supported it and played the daft one. But um, that's kind of a backstory that not many people knew, and so I'm really grateful that he brought that through to the big screen. What did you think of the amazing prosthetics on oh, John C. Reilly particularly? Yeah, that was incredible. Um, you know, I, I think that both actors really took on the part of Stan and Ollie from their voices to their mannerisms. Um, just really incredible, incredible job. Now, there is a lot of die-hard fans out there who are just as protective as the family are about the, getting the story right. Now, in every movie, there's always a little bit of dramatic license. And some of the feedback that we have been getting, um, a lot of people saying, Lauren Hardy never had an argument. Now, we weren't there. 30 years, 40 years, whoever, anybody, anybody who is friends, your best friend, for instance, I'm sure you've had an argument with your best friend or uh, members of your family, we've all done it. Do you believe that they never actually had a single disagreement in all the time they were together? You know, my grandmother always did say that they were so close and the best of friends and that they did hang out on weekends, but their friendship was a very long time. And I would agree that, you know, in any relationship, whether it be a marriage or a friendship, that at some point you do have a disagreement or somebody could hurt your feelings. And I think that, again, Jeff did a good job of, yeah, they had a disagreement, but he brought it brought it circled back around to the fact that you know neither one of them really meant what they said and that they really did love each other um you know and we're the best of friends what's next for you and what's your involvement now with the laurel estate are, are you uh, going to be doing anything in the future with with regards to to the memory of laurel and hardy yeah so um 
I don't know, many people have heard about the archives and the books and the legacy that uh, my grandmother had that had been passed down to her from her father. And it was always her intent uh, to publish them. And sadly, Grandpa Tony and her were working on that, and then he passed away. And so it just never came to fruition. Um, so what I've done at this point, and it seems like I've got support from Jeff and uh, you know, possibly other people that work at E1 um, and Fable Films to get those out to the fans and to make them so that people can actually have their own copy. Um, so we are working on that. We just have to figure out exactly how to do it and find the right people to, you know, get it, get it out there. That's great news, and the fans will be delighted to hear that. Uh, what's your most prized possession of stands? I would have to say, uh, and my son was wearing it last night, but his watch, um, his cocktail ring, and his money clip. Um, that's something to me that, you know, really holds energy and value. And um, every time I wear it, I just feel so much more confident. And, you know, you really get a sense of, you know, I don't know. I just, I believe in energy. And, and when I put on his jewelry or when I look at his pictures or when I read his content, um, you know, I, I really start to understand who he was and how, how he truly loved his work. That was his true love. As you know, he had many wives, but, um, but his, his true love was his work. Now, what's people's normal reaction when you tell them who you are, when you say Stan Laurel was your great-grandfather? Are they take like, total shock? Or, uh, what's the reaction generally like? Yeah, most people just kind of stare at me and, and, and don't know how to react. Um, not that I go around telling people. Um, but When it comes up. You yeah, know. when it comes up, um, it's definitely, you know, they've just got this faint look on them. They just can't believe it, you know. And, I mean, I'm just so grateful to have been born in such a legacy of family, not only my great-grandfather, but my grandfather, um, as you know, we're both in many pictures, and you know, for me, there's a huge responsibility to maintain, um, you know, their character and and just to continue the legacy of of giving back to people because that's truly who my great grandfather was. As you know, he was published in the phone book and to the writer or actor. He really wanted to to see people thrive and uh, and live their dreams and their passion like he did. Like the rest of us, I'm sure you wish you could have met him. You know, that would have been really cool. I have a lot of questions myself, um, but I do feel like I did know him in some respect because I took care of Grandma for 15 years, and she shared a lot of her stories and a lot of the information. And, you know, she always said he was a lovely, lovely man and that he was just super kind and generous, and, you know, he would have done anything for anybody. And I, and I think the movie does show that, um, you know, how much he did love you know, his wife, he loved his partner, you know, he, he loved his job. There was a lot of love um, that, that came out of him. What would you say to fans out there who are still on the fence about whether or not, because some, some people are against biopics in general, some people just don't like biographical movies. Uh, what would you say to the fans out there? Should they go and see this movie? I think they should go see the movie, and again, I, I believe that this movie is going to open a whole new generation of fans and then if they have questions they can do their own research and there's pr plenty of content out there um, that they can make their own decision. Thank you so much for spending the time with us today. I really hope you've enjoyed your trip to London and uh, I hope to see you on the other side sometime next time in, I'm in California. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks Ross. Appreciate it. The Ross Owen Show is sponsored by Hullmasters, Edry Trust, World War II TV and Indigo Unified Communication.